Aloha mai kako. My name is Lisa Leilani Ka'anoi from the Healthcare Workforce Development Center, known as Maoli Ola Ma Lama Lama at Papa Ola Lokahi, the Native Hawaiian Health Board. I'd like to mahalo you all for joining us today and mahalo to those that will be joining us later via the recording. So um, if you had already heard the little notification, this is being recorded and it will be shared with everyone that registered for the webinar, um, usually in about seven to 10 days after today's presentation. So in the future, if there's a webinar you'd like to see but aren't able to, as long as you register, you will still receive the recording. Now for questions or comments, you may use the question and answer feature or the chat feature located on the Zoom toolbar at the bottom of your screen. If this is the first time you're joining us, you will be automatically added to our email list for future presentations. And last, at the end, there will be a survey that pops up and this is where we get our ideas for future webinars and topics. Um, so if you have to run and you don't have time to fill out the um, questionnaire or survey after this, we'll resend it on Monday. Um, so you don't have to worry about that. All right, so let's get started. Oops. Can you folks see me there? Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce our guest speaker today of Growing Up Double Native in Hawaii. Um, Reno is an alum of Kamehameha Schools, class of 1978, and he attended Brigham Young University here in Hawaii. Also the University of Hawaii at Manoa and University of California, Los Angeles. He is currently working at the State of Hawaii, Department of Human Services in the Social Services Division. Reno is a lifetime student of La'au Lapa'au from Tutu Emma Keloha and also from Pops Ungaliok. I hope I said that right. Um, and his favorite dessert is Kulolo. Um, so, Reno. Aloha. Start video. Hi, so, aloha everyone. Uh, aloha Reno, just want to let everyone know that Mealii Prieto um, unfortunately was unable to make it today, um, but she does send her regards. And so Reno gets to have the floor today. Um, so Reno, I'll turn it over to you. Mahalo, thank you. And um, I'm, I'm grateful and happy to be here. Uh, but before we continue on, I wanted to share something that my tutu had um, shared with uh, the OIC, which is the Oahu Intertribal uh, Committee, which, is, uh, which helps to um, make community with uh, Native Americans and Native Hawaiians in Hawaii. We had gone ahead and shared a um, uh, with a group of people that were here. And they were having their uh, big conference and Indians from all over the 48 states and then Alaskans that were involved were gathering. So we wanted to do something different. And so I shared a... Reno, can you share your video? Oh, okay. Oh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> Kalamani, catching up. Um, as I said, said before, it's, it's a um, chant that was turned into a lullaby. And this chant was in uh, the Hawaiian response, my tutu's response um, back in the day for babies coming out of Kalau Papa. So the song or the lullaby goes, and uh, Lisa knows this, um, and so does Auntie Kathy, if you're out there, Aloha Auntie Kathy. Um, it goes, kumai, 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 eh. Namakanili, ili, i, namakaninui, kumai, 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 eh. Eh, namakani, namakani, eh. 
Uho olo lia na ho o vai vai o le e loko mai ka i mau noa e. Uho olo lia na ho o vai vai o le e loko mai ka i mau noa e. Ku mai ku mai ku mai e. E na makani na makani e. Ku mai ku mai ku mai e. Na makani li i li i maka mai e. Um, the song was sung as they brought children out from Kalaupapa. They would walk the steps. And those of you who have visited Kalaupapa, those are steep cliffs, and the steps are on that. And sometimes a baby would cry, and they would sing these songs as lullabies. And um, my tutu would pass it on, and, and, and her brothers and sisters would pass it on, and it, it became lullabies for us. And we didn't realize what it was. but Having gone through the pandemic and our community, our local community, um, remembering that we've survived pandemics and other epidemic um, disasters in the past, this is one of those things that we wanna pass on. So mahalo for the opportunity to share it with you folks. Mahalo for uh, leaving this ho'omaika'i with you. And um, there it is. So now, um, talking about double native, I think one of the things that uh, we forget in Hawaii as we mix with so many different races around the world, um, sometimes when you come here to Hawaii, you get so enwrapped in life here and you forget that there was life elsewhere. And um, sometimes your grandparents and great grandparents have a tendency to um, cut short, get on with the business of living in Hawaii. And the generations that come don't get to hear the bloodlines that are, have been included into the aloha, what we are today. Um, mind you, I do not have the right to judge how my kupuna had, um, had loved in the past. Were it not for that love, I wouldn't be here. So I don't have that luxury. But uh, what I can do in honoring them is to learn who I am and to go ahead and accept and make a good life out of it. Uh, that's why Hawaii is the way it is. It's, it's wonderful. We have our problems, but it's wonderful. You can actually be who you want to be here in Hawaii. And I'm very grateful for that blessing that oh my goodness. Um, but being double native, um, mama side is from the Keloha family. Um, Big Island Honoka'a, Haina Honoka'a, uh, Hawaii Island. Um, Papa's side has uh, roots in Maui, uh, Nene, Ha'ili Maili, um, all that area, Wailuku, and also um, one side Filipino, Chinese, and the other side Native American. And uh, that side, that Native American, um, are people from the Pacific Northwest. And so uh, the Shoshone people who are the people of Sacagawea and uh, um, the Lummi who are the Pacific Northwest, the very, very last Native American group that before you go into Canada and they're up in Bellingham, Washington. And um, you know, when I found that out, I was, going, I was in my early teens and I'm, what that, you know, never know who, who those people were. But over time, when you do research, you begin to find out you mix with these people, these bloodlines. And it was not just my family, but my cousins and other families who growing up, we thought were hmm, another Chinese or another Filipino kind of group of people. We didn't know. But as time went on, um, we, I, we found out and uh, you know, in the 70s, everyone was awakening. You know, you had the Kanyaku Imin with the Japanese, the 100 years. You had the Hawaiian, the beginning of the Hawaiian Renaissance. And as you start to read your history or the history, you begin to find out that um, so many people are mixed. And just because they came from New England, they weren't necessarily all Caucasian, you know? Um, a lot of the, the well trades 
when the first Indians came, they came on those ships uh, with the whaling ships. And those were Indians who were um, boatswains, people who um, were working the boats. And a lot of them were um, Indians from the Massachusetts area. So Pequots and Wampanoags and Nipmucks and Shinnecocks. And they were the ones who were doing carvings, scrimshaw carvings on, on bone. So um, learning that part of history, realizing that some of them are buried in the Lahaina cemeteries and realizing, you know, even though they had English sounding names, they were known as Indians in the places that they were coming from. Um, Coombs, Coffee, um, Harris, those are names in the cemeteries at, um, in Lahaina. So um, growing up uh, native, I, had a classmate, uh, I went to Kamehameha, uh, I'm the class of 78. And as I, I didn't know at the time, but as after you graduate, you find more about your classmates. And um, I had one classmate and her name was uh, Puamana Seymour, which is um, Mealii, who was doing the last um, uh, thing like this. And, and she and her daughter, Rosie, um, Pua was her sister, and uh, it was her sister that I, I got to know. And she found, I, I said, you part Filipino? And she said, no, I'm part Native American. And as the conversation evolved, she found out that I was also, you know, um, and then I found out other classmates, you know, who, who were mixed, Hawaiian mixed with Pacific Northwest Indian blood, um, Navajo, Apache, some of the Mexican Indians from Baja California, you know, and you know, Hawaiians mixed, Hawaiians really mixed. And uh, I got involved with the, the power circuit here in Hawaii. I had um, four wonderful um, blessed years working with, with the OIC, which is the Oahu Intertribal Com Committee and um, had learned a lot. I was grateful to have been able to make that time and um, learn a lot of local people who were mixed with Indian blood and native Alaskan blood. So um, yeah, some of the challenges were interesting. Um, you know, growing up in those times, you were either this or that, if it was on the radar. Um, a lot of people didn't know. Um, I, I, case in point, I have, a, I have cousins who are uh, Burinki, Puerto Rican Hawaiian, and they didn't know that Burinki was actually the indigenous people of Puerto Rico. And when you started to take a look at some of the genealogy that came out from that, a great many of them were 50% or almost full blood that migrated to Hawaii, um, Burinki or Taino. And that's a Native American group of people. So that's included in the powwow circuit. That's included in um, the uh, Native American tribes that are recognized in the United States. Okay, Lisa, any questions? Okay, well, I'm gonna go ahead and share some references. Um, in conversation with Lisa, she's saying, oh, are there anything, any um, videos or um, resources that you can share that can help um, people if they want to go ahead and start doing their um, research on double native um, or, or at least uh, Hawaiians and Native American in certain regions. For the Pacific Northwest, there are two books that I can, I can uh, suggest. And one is called Kanaka, The Untold Stories of Hawaiian pioneers in British Columbia and the Pacific Northwest. And the author is Tom Koppel. And you can, I had the book and somebody borrowed it, but uh, you can get that book through Amazon. Um, and it, it gives stories of actual Hawaiian families. Um, one, was, one was known as the Naukana family, um, also known as Naukane. And um, you know, these are people who are in Canada and Salt Spring Island, and as well as Vancouver area. Um, another book 
is uh, Leaving Paradise and it's Indigenous Hawaiians in the Pacific North Northwest years 1787 through 1898. Um, author is Jean Barman and Bruce McIntyre Watson. And um, they talk about the Hawaiian labor migrations with the Vancouver Company, which used um, the term swimming Indians. Uh, that's how they, they called Hawaiians because nobody knew what Hawaiians were. Um, and it, it tells a good story about not only um, the town of Aloha, Oregon, but Aloha, Washington as well. It speaks about the, the Kalama family who factor very heavily in the um, uh, Nisqually Indian tribe up in Washington. And it mentions um, the Roland family who are uh, in Suquamish, Washington. Um, there's also other books. Um, I learned Spanish when I used to live in uh, Southern California. And there are other books written by, if you speak Spanish or read Spanish, um, that speak about Hawaiians who were there um, in the late 1700s in Southern California amongst the Chumash, um, which, who actually called themselves um, Pacific Islanders more than uh, Indians. Um, and uh, they talk about certain individual families that only had one name, but live in the um, Los Angeles, um, preferably the, the Malibu and all the way down south to San Diego area. And uh, it was interesting to, to go and, and, and read it and find out that these people were actually Hawaiian, Hawaiian people that had been let off by the ships that were coming up from Hawaii up to the main West Coast and just let off, just taken on ships and then fend for yourselves. And, um, reading that kind of history, you realize that, gosh, our people were resilient. You know, um, if they survived the trip, they didn't catch any diseases. They went and they ended up meeting up and marrying in with the indigenous folk. So, um, you know, and, and you can find out more and more information as you start pulling the information out. Okay, so there's one question here. And it's by Richard Rothschilder. And it said, when I visited Oregon, I have always heard the spirit of the Pacific Northwest. Any thoughts on that concept? Um, yeah. Um, when I used to go visit family up in um, Pacific Northwest, up, up in Lummi area, and we would have potlatches, which were pretty much an Indian version of a luau. And, um, then there, of course there were dances and, and, and whatnot. And the feeling was very much like how you're saying, you know, Richard, um, of course it, it's a little different. You get the generational trauma of their contact with the English and um, the colonialism that had happened up in that area. Um, I can't really talk for certain about the rest of the Native American Indian tribes, so only what I've heard and experienced from the tales and the mo'olelo that they would, the family would share in family gatherings. And um, they call, they, a lot of times they call it the, the great silence. Um, yeah, the smallpox was heavy up there and um, a lot of the other diseases and whole villages were um, decimated by the diseases, but yet the, the people were resilient. And they did mention about um, the blending of people from the sea. Um, and they would talk about the people from the sea having great, great, great spirit to survive. And you know, I, I can only imagine some of the um, stories that were told and realizing that you share these two blood lineages of um, two indigenous people who were surviving in, in the late 1800s, you know, just so they could make it to today. But um, the gathering spirit, yeah, the, the gathered spirit of family, the gathered spirit of uh, food, drink, and music. Um, you know, we. Uh, there's some songs that were 
Hawaiian inspired. You know, when you sit down, you listen to some of the old folks sing them, and then all of a sudden, a, a, a different kind of melody comes out, which is not not the same melody as you would normally get with uh, traditional Indian singing. But they 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 say for certain that that's an Indian song, and you realize, okay, the influence is there, the um, Hawaiian influence is there, and um, you know they would share that they would share there at the family gatherings. Um, you know, there's there's a whole lot of um, spiritualism which is very very similar to us here in the islands, and. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of uh, sharing, but, you know, they went through a period up there in the Northwest in which not only did the churches persecute them, but uh, the law. And there was a whole lot of, um, uh, you, you can't do any potlatches. You can't do any giveaways. A potlatch is basically a giveaway. And they give away all of their things. And they, they aloha, basically. And food, lots and lots of food and the renewal of family uh, relationships. So thank you for asking that question, Richard. Let's see, what else is there? Auntie Kathy provided some links to, for, re, um, for folks to refer to. Leaving Paradise, Indigenous Hawaiians Northwest, and Kanaka Hawaiian Pioneers, Columbia Northwest. Yes. For the first one, Living, Leaving Paradise, the authors are Jean, Jean Barman and Bruce McIntyre Watson. Um, the, the other one, Kanaka, the untold story of Hawaiian pioneers in British Columbia, the Pacific Northwest, the author is Tom Coffin. Um, for my ohana who's out there, I know that some of you are out there. And some of you know the stories too. And uh, for, for a long time, I remember a cousin of mine when we were growing up, she didn't know. She said, oh, where's the poi balls? <laughs> and, and Tutu would say, no, that's not Maori. It's Indian. And uh, when you look at some of the stuff up in the Pacific Northwest, some of their um, motifs, and um, they, they do have a paddle dance, which is, you know, the Maori have a, a spear dance with the tayaha. And it looks very similar, but it's handled totally different. And one is basically a can, uh, canoe paddle. And um, I, have, I, I was able to do a photo shoot and was able to bring some of those things out, um, the cedar hat. And um, I, <laughs> I remember two, two folks having them. And she said, oh, the Hawaiian hat, which is the love hala hat, or the Indian hat, which is, it looks like a, um, wait a minute, I, I, can, I can bring it out for you uh, later on. But um, yeah, it's a cedar hat made out of cedar, cedar wood and woven, almost look with large weave, um, but definitely not, not love hala. Um, I think in growing up sometimes, you know, we're a little confused because we would say, oh, that's native. And then re referring to the Hawaiian side, or that's native, 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 re referring to the Hawaiian and native, uh, Native American Indian side. So, um, you know, growing up, there was a little bit of confusion. And mind you, um, some of my Hawaiian relatives, um, you know, they, I'm the first one that went to Kamehameha but the other ones went to Catholic schools and, and other schools. So assimilation was very important um, and assimilation to this American style of, thing, of way of doing things uh, was very important. So that side of the family was very hush-hush. They wouldn't speak of anything, even though on our Hawaiian side, we came from very rich, um, rich history, especially when it came to Hawaiian medicine and the understanding of um, you know, Hoponopono and Lomi and um, you know, all these things of recipes to make uh, medicine la'au. So um, it, it was kind of a little schizophrenic. So if that was that with them, and, and these were aunties and uncles, you know, older aunties and uncles, um, 
gosh, you can imagine sharing some of the things that were Indian. You know, um, they, oh, you don't want to know that. Or why would you want to know that? Because that's not how we live today. You know, or, you know, and, and I'll speak truth to matter. Um, they would say, oh, everything is done English. Mind you, I had plenty of relatives to this day who are very well versed in pidgin. And pidgin is how you communicate even to this day. Um, some, some words would, would uh, some, some relatives would be really, if you, oh, oh, oh how, come, how come you don't like talk with me? And, and you know, if you didn't understand what they were saying, how, how, don't, how come you don't come to our level? You're one of us, you know? So yeah, those are, those are interesting times. You, you, things have changed really, really changed. And, and um, I'm 62, so um, I mean, not look it, but I'm 62. And so I remember being around those kupuna and, um, you know, they would be quiet, no, no talk about that in public. But then when you get home and after you call, 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 sitting around watching Wonderful World of Disney, then they start talking, you know, and um, you, you could, you could feel um, there was there was a lot of hedging, a lot of hiding, or, or if they did, they would be late into the night, they would they would talk. So there you go. That's um, some of the um, pictures that I took at um, our photo shoot at Blaisdell Park, and some of the uh, regalia and, and clothing and items that we wear. The hat is a, a cedar hat. And it's a typical hat of the Pacific Northwest Indians. Um, red and black are the colors that we, we use, or red, red and navy blue. Um, the paddle, I don't know if there's a picture, Lisa, where the paddle is turned around. It has the motif of, of the tribe, and the colors of the tribe. And the drum that I have there is um, from the Well Clan, which is um, part of the clans that that we come from, or, or you can say the Amakua, the Amakua that um, guards the family. Story about the Amakua, I went up to, it's called the uh, canoe journeys, and I was uh, able to go to one back in 2012 with, with relations, and we were paddling with the Ahauset, which is a, a group of uh, tribal Indians from, from the coast. And um, you talk about similarity, Richard, um, so we're paddling and we're paddling late into the night. We're one of the last canoes and we were double canoes. So there are two hulls and people. So there are about 24 people in the canoe and we're paddling and we're paddling. We're, we're making our way. We had a couple of older folk who were tired. So a lot of the young ones were really pulling. And as we were coming in, uh, one of the elders started to sing an old, uh, old song. And he was Nuxet. And um, which is related to the Lummi. And we were pulling in and we were close to shore and we could see the dock and it was already, it was really misty. There was still a lot of people on the dock. And, and I, on the corner of my eye, there was this huge, huge dorsal fin that was coming in between us. And, and I was like, what is going on? And you could get all that chicken skin feeling. And the canoe got quiet. People were chattering, but then it got quiet. And, this elder who continued to sing. And um, when he realized what was happening, it was, a, it was an orca, it was a killer whale that was swimming between the two of us and his dorsal was uh, hitting the ama or the connecting part of the canoe and was pushing us forward to the point where we really didn't have to paddle. He was making its way and the water was really, really calm. And um, somebody had uh, from another canoe had shined a light on it. We had seen it was a big orca. And um, it was like early evening. And it was so chicken skin because he gave us that push to finally get to shore. And it was an incred incredible feeling. Um, you know, you're in the canoe and it's the first time. It was my first trip. And it was the first time with my relatives and you could hear a pin drop. Everyone was really, really quiet. 
and finally when we got to the shore and um you know bald eagles hang out but we didn't realize why they were there they were all on top of the trees looking at us and as we got out of the canoe they were there and quiet um, we turned around and we saw the orca and his pod go out the, the other way and uh everyone everyone was just it was a reverent moment we had uh, we had an experience that was totally amazing uh, to this day i know there's a lot of people from hawaii all the all the different islands who have friends and relatives up in the pacific northwest and every year there's a large Hawaiian contingency that goes up all on their own to um, go and pull. That's how they say paddle, to pull um, in the canoe journeys. Each tribe gets involved. Um, it, it's the, the group of people up there, they're called the Salish, the Coastal Salish. Um, it's like us here in Hawaii, we're Hawaiian and we all speak Hawaiian, but we have our different dialects. It's the same thing with them with uh, the coastal Salish. They all speak Salish and there's certain ways where you come from and speak it. Lummi being right up at the very north. So we speak a little different than the Mokoshoot and we're further south of the Swinomish. Um, but uh, yeah, that was, the Amokua did come, come and it was awesome. That one, that's my very first time, to 2012. And uh, I'll never forget that. So, yep. you. There's a lot of things that are very similar uh, with uh, Native American culture and Hawaiian. Anybody raising hands? I can um, share um, the tribes of Washington. Hold on. This will help. The, um, the tribe up in Washington are the, um, the Lummi. So there you are, it's right next to the Bellingham and the Nooksack, which are our neighbors, they're related. Um, there's a definite Hawaiian feel up in that area. Hawaiians did go up in that area um, and they were with part of the, uh, the Vancouver uh, company. Um, but uh, the, all the people that are listed within the Seattle area and then further up on Vancouver Island um, and up into Canada, are all related, we speak the same language. And then if you go to the far, farther east, the language starts to dissipate and you have little groups of people. So these are the groups of people here that you see the Kalispell, the Spokane, it's actually, it's not, it's Spokane, not Spokane, um, the Colville and the Yakima. Um, they have uh, little surviving groups of uh, mountain, um, or Plains Salish amongst them. Up in Canada, there's the Okanagan, um, the Lakula, all those people. So when we do have the canoe journeys, if you look on the screen, going to, uh, if you see Seattle, further south, there's a group of people called the Puyallup. So from that area, Skokomish, Puyallup, Squaxin, um, they paddle all the way up to Lummi and back down, or sometimes the relatives on Vancouver Island, um, they're, they're in that area where you see all the small islands. There are Indians there, Indian tribes, um, Musqueam, um, all the, uh, Haida, there's some Haida up in that area. And they all speak, all speak we all speak the same root language. And uh, yeah, the, the tribes are all interconnected by the language and quite a few, quite a few of them have Hawaiian, um, Hawaiian connections, whether it's to Hawaiians that had come up and lived there amongst them and blended their, their blood to some of the, the fishing techniques that, that have been passed down over the years, over the generations. Um, in, the, in the book Kanaka, um, Hawaiian Pioneers, there, if you look in, uh, over there on that map, Puget Sound is there and you go directly up just to the, the left of the Sain Lummi. Those islands in there, the San Juan Islands, and um, they're all small islands. A great majority of them were settled by Hawaiian people 
Hawaiian pioneers and who ended up marrying Indian women. And so those areas um, were, that was known as the fruit basket because of those Hawaiian pioneers. And uh, you know, they grew apples and all kinds of stuff um, for the people of Vancouver as well as Washington area. Um, you know, but yeah, going up in that area, if you look all the way down south, you'll see Shoalwater Bay, Chehalis, Nisqually is where the Kalamas are or a lot of Kalama people. Up, up north, you see the Mukoshoot. That's where my paddle comes from. And then, um, but the Mukoshoot are another group of people. It's, it's the, the community is Mukoshoot, but there are several different Indians who, they were small groups, like one, three, five families, and they would mix together uh, to be protected. And then Hawaiians would come in and mix with them. So that, that's there. Um, to the very far left at the tip of Nia Bay are the Makas. And um, I think they're the most Hawaiian of the group, um, the way how they, they act and they do. Their, their, they're the ones who actually go out uh, hunting whales and they'll take a whale, one or two whales a year and they do it all by boat. Um, they have learned, they, a lot of them have come down. So them, some of you folks who paddle, especially up the North Shore, Wailua Way, um, you know my cousin, um, Larson Mondina, he's helped teach a lot of them how to paddle so they can um, speed paddle and get to, their, get to the whale. Um, but they've learned how to paddle. A lot of them come to Hawaii to learn how to paddle. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of people up in Macaw who are Hawaiian mix. Um, they have names like Ayun and Aquin and Hussey. And there's quite a few of uh, uh, Johannesons that are there all from um, Havi area, Big Island. Um, and they all live in Makah. They married Makah people. So this is the American side, but if uh, British Columbia, there's quite a few too. Um, uh, when I went to go visit in the, the town of Kelowna, which is kind of like their um, their vacation place. Um, I met I met some Hawaiian people who were fourth generation, and they live up in Kelowna and they married Indian. So you see this big kind of uh, you can tell Hawaiian, but there's also that Indian ness about them. And when you look at them and they look at you, um, other than the way how we talk, the the way how we move, it you can just feel it. And um, it's, it's really interesting. New message. Yeah, um, it does sound like Makaha, but Maka is the name of the people and the name of their, um, their tribe. Um, you, you know, when you hear, when you hear Salish, um, it, it, it's a very different tongue. I mean, you know, we have Aloha Mai Kako, you know, you know, it's definitely Hawaiian. Um, there's a certain stress, uh, stressors in the way how we speak in a linguistic way. But um, Lummi, they're up the, the northern part of, the, uh, of Washington, the last one of the last groups. And Nooksuk, um, which are their, their cousins, their neighbors, um, they speak a, a coastal way of speaking. And so, um, really don't close or open their, their mouths. So the, the word for thank you is anhut, and it's A-N-H-U-T. So we say mahalo, and then sometimes you anhut, and you're, you're way, the way how you say thank you, everything is your hands are up. So you, your hands are up, you, I say anhut. Um, if, it's a, if it's a really cool thing, or it's a really, you can use it like aloha, the, the term otsiam, you know, and, and um, the old folks, that S is kind of like a, like a shh. So it's ocean, you know. Um, but every now and then when, when you hear an elder who's been raised by a Hawaiian Indian person, you know, um, you, you, can hear, you can hear a little bit of that, a little Hawaiian accent that comes out, you know, because um, I, I had a, a grand tutu up there 
and she would say otsiam otsiam to everybody otsiam but then when it came to the ones visiting from hawaii uh, from hawaii they would she would say ohim ohim um or and she would say ahuna which is uh, uh, uh it's actually ahuna ahuna which means um um, amongst them, it means uh, my, my relation, my kin of kin to my breast, ahuna. And I, I always tell them, oh, that, that's a family name, ahuna. You know, just, no, 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 ahuna. You know, and uh, it kind of translates to punahele. And believe you me, that, that concept is very well known amongst them. Uh, they have a lot of punahele in, in their. And they will tell you, they'll tell you point blank, this is my ahun, this is my punahele, hands off, you know. Um, kind of remind, remind me of some of the tutu in our communities when they take a liking to someone, you know, they call you that you punahele. But um, some of the, the interesting things or problems um, growing up, I look back on, on, um, Representation, it, it would have been nice. It would have been nice. I, I know the 70s and 80s were a rough time. Um, wine started to feel good about themselves, you know, amidst of all the statistics that were happening. And, and the statistics are still there. But, uh, you know, I used to, I used to tell people <clears throat> um, growing up and going to Kamehameha and having the the blessing and opportunity to work on uh, my you know, explorations and, and, and seeing those kids who came from the Pacific Northwest who were basically Hawaiian Indian and they were coming to explorations and, you know, to, uh, to see that, not realizing or realizing that here are people just like me, you know, Hawaiian Indian mix in this area. And, um, how they were very, very grateful and humble to be there, you know, to see the beauty of what Kamehameha had to offer and, and to be a part of that you know, years later. Um, in reading some of the stories, um, you know, listening to some of this, the uh, tales and researches, researches that I've, I found of some of these pioneers, it, it was very rough. It was very rough for those Hawaiian pioneers. The race issue was a real thing. Um, you know, you can't really sanitize it because you know our, our country is in the throes of, of trying to deal with our racism. And knowing that and then putting that into context with these Hawaiian pioneers who were definitely not, not fair complected um, they had issues with uh, who they lived with and where they lived and how they conducted their lives, what they can and could not do. And, you know, the, um, the suspectness of living close to, um, you couldn't live with an Indian community or you fared better if you lived in an Indian community than if you didn't live in a white community. And uh, I admit sometimes going up there, it, it was hard. It was hard. It was better. I was better off if I said I was from Hawaii. And I was treated like, oh, you're going home soon. Okay. You know? Um, and, and you get that every now and then. You get that every now and then from people who are, are less than, um, their aloha is less than zero on that kind of stuff. You know? Um, I was always taught though, my Hawaiian side was always te teaching me, okay, they're gonna be that way, okay, you pray for them, you gotta forgive them, and then you move on. You know, and I think I think that's a healthy thing, you know, knowing that people take their time to change, especially with those kinds of things of racism. Um, but, you know, we have our own issues here in Hawaii. And, you know, the, the the newest one on the on the ladder when they come, gets the most teasing, you know? Um, and that certainly was, we certainly had our, our, our portion of that um, growing up as, well, 
You're Indian. What kind of Indian? You know, Punjab Indian kind. Or kind of wish that it would crack open an encyclopedia. Thank goodness we have computers now where they, they'll go ahead and you can get the information right at your fingertips. And, and you want me to, um, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Do you want me to pull up the video of the potlatch and the Native Hawaiian, the one you yeah. were telling me about? Yeah, go ahead. You found what, it. Um, what is it? What, how do I find it? Um, it? Well, it's actually just put in potlatch. And then there'll, there'll be a variety of them there. Okay. For, for those of you who don't know what a potlatch is, it's a, it's a gathering. Um, it's usually a, a long house, a big house that's made out of cedar. And um, it has an ornate door and the whole tribe goes in and you have, it, it's basically a gathering to celebrate uh, for things like birthdays, deaths, um, culture gatherings where you would um, dispense tribal information. Um, many of the tribes up there who have heavy Hawaiian um, genealogy in them have turned a lot of it into luau type of things. So you would hear Hawaiian music some, um, some of the songs that they would sing. I have the Samish Potlatch Native Hawaiian song sharing. Try that. That one or is that a different one? Go ahead, try that one. Journey Potlatch, hosted by the Samish Indian Nation, Curtis Washington. Enjoy the Potlatch evening song sharing with Native Hawaiian. <laughs> These type of gatherings that they have, um, a lot of times these are the people from Hawaii that are being included as pullers or we're going to paddle in the journey. So there's a cultural exchange. And this was with, with the Samish, Swinomish uh, people, uh, neighbors of ours to the south. Oh, by the way, they. If you're from Hawaii and you're up in Washington and it's that time, one of the questions they're gonna ask, can you paddle? You Hawaiian, can you paddle? And next next thing is, okay, come, let's go paddle. Um, they like the way how we paddle because we, we don't have a lot of, um, we have an urgency. And I think that's the Hawaiian way. You know, getting from one place to the other, you, you make sure you do. So um, because of that, a lot of local people go up, uh, paddlers go up and get into these kinds of situations where there's culture sharing and then there's, uh, they want to bless you as you get into their canoes.
Now let's skip to um, the, the response. Let's see. Yeah, go ahead. Let's see how if we can see if any of the tribes how they. Yeah, keep going. I think I think this is all Hawaiian, yeah. Yeah. All right, we'll try another one. Any questions, folks, so far? I want to try to find another video with the potlatch. Oh, I think this would be the good time to um, um, say it. Um, in September, the second weekend in September, I think nine and, nine and 10, 10 or 11, at the Bishop Museum, there's the, um, there's a powwow. And a powwow is a, a gathering of Indian people, no, for, no matter what region you're from. Um, but all Indian people, and um, it's going to be at the Bishop Museum. Come, see. There'll be I'll be there. There's going to be all kinds of uh, people. For the longest time, um, powwow, especially too when we had it at the uh, Thomas Square, was a place where Indians and people who were related to Indians and who had Indian uh, culture and blood in their in their families. Could come and gather and, and um, get to know one another. And you know, you don't have to be Indian to, to come, just come. You know, you probably see some cousins that are there. And, and it's not just Hawaiian and Indian, it's, 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 I find that there's a lot of local people who have Indian blood in them. You know, I, I saw someone, I had met somebody who was from, from Utah and they lived in Hawaii now and they were, to me, they look like, you know, another brother from Wainai or Waimanalo or Kalihi. And um, <clears throat> I knew him for quite some time. He, he drove bus and he spoke pigeon, you know, and everything. But he was, he was actually Chinese Indian, Chinese youth Indian. And um, I won't mention his name, but he still drives the bus. But um, he used to tell me, oh, you know, after the Chinese finished building the railroad in Piedmont, Utah, they had a hard time getting to San Francisco to get home to China. So a lot of them just stayed and they were forbidden to marry into the white populace. So they ended up marrying Indians. And so he said, yeah, he, they, it was not unusual to, to have people who he knew um, and even him growing up um, and, and, and he knew that uh, they had they had names like um, uh, four four feathers fong, you know, or or um, Nasimka's Nesim, hole, and the Nesim, was um, running dog, you know, and so they went running dog hole, you know, so it, it was not unusual to have those kinds of things. And he said a lot of people from his tribe ended up moving to Hawaii. Because uh, you know they got tired, they got tired of having to explain their life away, and uh, but there you see the 46th annual uh, Honolulu Intertribal Powwow. It's um, September 10th and 11th, 10 to 5, Bishop Museum. Please come. Um, you get a chance to see a, a lot of uh, Indians who live in Hawaii. Not only those who um, come to school here or in the military, but some of us who have chose, chosen. Hawaii to be their home, whether they have connections, blood ties to Hawaii or not, they've made Hawaii their home. And, um, you know, just look for it. We, uh, COVID did a number on us the last two times, the last couple of years, but we're here, um, you know, Hawaii is opening up, come. And uh, by the way, the museum will also be open to people. And there's a couple of exhibits there. 
Um, mind you, some of the things that Captain Cook had left behind um, were from the Pacific Northwest. So there are some Pacific Northwest Indian displays up in that area. And I hope you guys come and enjoy. And you know, if you see me there, you know, stop me and say, hey, brother, hi, how are you? Have a nice time. Get to meet some of the people that are there. Um, Lisa will be there. <laughs> hope Auntie Kathy, you can come. But you'll be surprised to see who, who's there, and especially those who you find out, oh, wow, you have, you put, put Indian too. You know? So um, there's also, if you're on the big island, there's also, a, um, also in September, I don't know the dates for sure, but uh, Rudy Tehawanase and his wife, who is Native Hawaiian, um, hold the big island powwow as well too. And uh, there's a lot of people that, that go to that one. It's a smaller one, but um, you get to see all the different type of regional differences among the Indians. Uh, of, of not only the Pacific Northwest, but the Southwest, the East. And, you know, um, you see other Indian tribes that you don't normally hear of, like you know, the, the Pequots or the Wampanoags, those are the people up in, or the Shinnecocks up in the Northeast, who are woodland Indians, or the Southwest, like the Seminole, you know, and, and the Cree, and, or the middle of the country, like the Wachita, the Osage, or like um, the, the moderators last time, or the people last time, um, Meili'i, Frieto, and her daughter, they're older Missouri, older Missouri Indians. Um, or, you know, there's, there's some people up from Alaska, so please come. Mahalo for that, Reno. Um, does anybody have any questions, feedback, comments? Um, we are, if you, we are also um, looking for Native Hawaiian vendors to sell Native Hawaiian arts and crafts. We're also looking for um, Native Hawaiian food vendor that can sell mei Hawaii. If you know of anyone, the uh, registration deadline for that is July 31st. And you can go to the website. Auntie Kathy put it in the chat, the Oahu Intertribal Council website to register there. Um, but does anybody have any questions for Reno? Um, very interesting the how close the relationships are. So when May and Rosie presented, it was mainly about how um, her mom started the powwows here years and you know the you can see it's the 46th annual this year how her mom actually started the very first powwow and so she you know kind of talked story more about the Native Americans within Hawaii so then there was a part two which was you right which is really interesting about the not just the relationships here on Oahu but how Hawaiians also went and traveled elsewhere so um, that is also very interesting as well. And um, now I'll think about that when I go visit Washington. <laughs> but I know that in Portland, so I lived in Portland for four years and I know that there's a large native Hawaiian group in Forest Grove, um, Pacific University, I think a lot of them attend yeah. there. So anytime, you know, we were missing home or anything, we would go to Forest Grove and, connect with some folks from there, but yeah. Um, oh yeah, so uh, if you missed previous presentations, what we do is uh, those that registered will be the first ones to get the recording. And then 30 days later, we will post it on our YouTube page for the general public. So in the, when you receive the recording, um, I'll add in the page, our YouTube page so that folks can look at other presentations that we've done that are up there as well. But um, mahalo, Reno. It was good Thank to you. see you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I know we had a little, we had a little pili kia trying to get connected, but we did it. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm technically challenged. So. <laughs> um, Thank you. Thank you for letting me share. Yeah, and mahalo and for everyone. Oh, and then I'll also, um, here, let me share one last thing before everyone goes. I know it's right at 1.30, but I'll also include this in the follow-up email. Um, these are the books that Rena was referring to. 
Um, again, mahalo Intikapi for the links. So Leaving Paradise, Indigenous Hawaiians in the Pacific Northwest, and then Kanaka, the untold story of Hawaiian pioneers in British Columbia and the Pacific Northwest. So if anyone's looking to do some reading, you have that. Um, the next, uh, so we usually have webinars the second and fourth Friday of every month, unless it falls on a uh, holiday. So the next one would have been the second Friday in June. That's a holiday, so we won't have one. So the next one I think will be like June 24th. We are actually working on a guest speaker for that one. So we'll send out an announcement for that. Um, so keep an eye out for that. And I know it's been uh, a heavy week for a lot of folks, uh, a lot of tragedies happening amongst other worries about being healthy and staying well. So I just want to, you know, tell everyone that, um, you know, be thinking about everyone, malama pono, malama kikahi, kikahi, and to take one day at a time and pule if you need to, um, but we will keep in touch. So ahui ho, malama pono.